Well, welcome everybody. Um, I'm Hilton Death, and um, as you see there, the uh, day is, and you said, is um, aseptic packaging. And what I want to do is to go through the, the key aspects. Um, uh, obviously, packaging is a is a big um, a big topic. Um, there are whole books written on packaging, and in particular, aseptic packaging. So, I guess I've just taken the, um, the important bits out of it. So what I want to talk about, I'll give you a bit of, that, a bit of background about um, aseptic packaging. What, what are the requirements of aseptic filling and why, why is it so important? Um, and then some of the components of the aseptic packaging system, what needs to be in place to, to get an aseptic package. Um, and sterilization methods, because it's important that everything is sterilized before we, we start. Um, the types of aseptic packages um, and You'll, you'll recognize uh, a lot of these. Um, integrity testing of the packages, just um, making sure that they're, they're sealed and that they, they don't leak or they won't leak and they won't allow um, other things to leak into there and, and uh, be contaminated. And then just a little bit on validation of an aseptic packaging system. If you put one in to start with, what are you going to do to make sure that it, um, it's going to be successfully used for a sterile product? And then just a few concluding remarks. So just as, as background, um, the um, oops, back one. Um, as I said, aseptic packaging um, is essential in UHT processing. If we didn't have aseptic packaging, we wouldn't be able to maintain our product in a sterile condition uh, during storage. And I guess for a long time, the UHT process had been um, known and used, but before they introduced aseptic packaging, particularly the cardboard carton, um, it, it really wasn't um, a goer. So that's really the thing that, that got UHT processing uh, up and running and has been so successful since the 60s. Uh, the, the milk is, UHT sterilized milk is, is packaged aseptically in, in uh, paperboard and, and in plastic containers. And I'll, I'll talk more about each of those uh, a bit later on because they, they each have their own um, uh, characteristics. I, I should say, I guess, in, at the very beginning that aseptic really means we don't have any bacteria. So that's, that's the, the important thing. And I guess the basis of, of this whole talk. Um, initially, aseptic packaging was done in cans. And, and this, this went on for quite some time. Um, the first patent was in 921, but they're actually being um, produced in, in uh, metal cans back in the um, in 1915s and so forth. So uh, that was the first thing, but that, um, that went out because the, the cans became too expensive. And it wasn't until uh, Tetra Pak, in fact, started um, making uh, the, uh, the cardboard carton um, that um, it, it really, really took off. So the first UHT milk was aseptically packaged in these cardboard cartons uh, in Switzerland in 1961. So that's really the beginning of aseptic packaging as we know it today. And of course, since then, it's um, uh, spread throughout the world. And um, I've just got a, a figure there of 30 billion litres. I don't know whether you can imagine what 30 billion litres is, but it's an awful lot of aseptic product um, now. And I've got there right at the end, and some of you remember um, I gave a talk on, on ESL processing um, a while back. And one of the options for ESL products, and ESL um, is a process of which is sub-UHT, but higher than pasteurization. So to, in order to uh, prevent post processing contamination, one option for ESL milk is to, to be produced in, in aseptic packages. Um, it's, it usually isn't, but that's a, an option um, to produce a, a product with a long shelf life. So it's not just UHT that um, milk that can be uh, uh, packaged in uh, aseptic packaging. Now, just in terms of the importance of aseptic filling, uh, it's been recognised for some time that the, the spoilage of UHT products is, is largely due to um, problems with the aseptic filling system. 
And that's, um, in other words, some bacteria are getting in there after the product has been sterilized. I think most people think that if you've got problems with um, non-sterile UHT packages that the, the heat process hasn't killed all the bugs. Well, that's usually not the case. Um, in most cases, the, the heat process is sufficient to, des to destroy all the organisms that are likely to grow in the UHT milk. <clears throat> Now, the aim of um, the spoilage aim is, is one in 10,000 uh, uh, packages. And I'll come back to that later on because that, that really is um, quite, a, quite an exacting um, um, aim, I guess. But most companies are, are, are achieving that. So if we want to have absolute sterility, we've got to, we've got to sterilize all the contact surfaces and the air spaces, and that's important after the holding tube, that's the UHT holding tube. So um, the holding tube contains the, the product has already been um, heat treated to the, the highest temperature in the process. Um, so it should be sterile at that point. So all the parts of the system between there and the final product have to be, have to be sterilized. <clears throat> now that can be done with hot water or steam and uh, so the aseptic tank, which I'll talk about in a little bit more later, and the filler heads in the, the filling machine and the valves, they all, a lot of those are uh, traditionally sterilized with um, hot water or, or steam. Uh, hydrogen peroxide mist and spray or vapor, um, often just used, usually called VHP, vaporized hydrogen peroxide, or a chemical fog, and there are a few people who are using a chemical fog like the, the Akasan, which is a phosphoric acid based um, detergent, um, for, for sterilizing the outside of the, the uh, compo components of the uh, aseptic filler. <clears throat> so it's impossible to, to treat all those with hot water or something like that, but uh, using a, a vapor or a spray is possible to to do that and to get into all the crevices. So that's, that's the, the, uh, the next part. Um, and then the packaging and packaging material have to be sterilized. And I'm going to talk a bit more about that because that's one of the, the key, key elements of it. Um, and I guess the other requirement for an aseptic filling system is that there's a positive air pressure, um, both within the, the um, aseptic tank and the aseptic zone in the in the filling machine and it doesn't have to be very a uh, very high pressure in fact we're only looking at half a bar half an atmosphere which is um, which is not much it's just so that um, you're not getting any ingress of, of air from from the the surrounding area which always contains uh, bacteria so that's that's fairly important and um, where that's not maintained it's quite possible to to get um, uh, contamination from the from the air, and that's happened in in, in many different um, machines. Uh, so the the air that's used or is is usually uh, HEPA filtered, and I've put there what HEPA HEPA stands for, high efficiency particulate air, because I can never remember what it stands for. I think we're just so used to talking about HEPA air, and sometimes gas is used for. Uh, for the positive pressure. Oops, I've gone backwards. Okay, so what are, what are the requirements for an aseptic system? Well, I guess what we need is a suitable container and some way of closing that container. And I'll talk more about that because that's um, that's an area where we can can get uh, get problems if that's not done properly. The container itself, the product contact surface, has to be sterilised. And there's a few ways we can do that. The container has to be filled without contamination. So that's, um, that's one of the requirements of what we call the aseptic zone. Um, and the closure has to be sterilized before applied. And that closure has to prevent um, any passage of organisms. So even if we've got a screw cap, that screw cap has to be, um, the, the, the closure has to be such that no bacteria can, can get in around the, the cap. So I've just put here a little diagram that I found, which I think just sums up uh, what we're talking about when we're talking about um, the aseptic filling system. 
outside of that system, um, we've got the raw material and the con continuous heating, and so that's basically our UHT plant. And then we've got our whole tube um, within this little dotted line here, and that's the aseptic filling system. The whole tube, the continuous cooling system, which we, we, we need after the whole tube. Then the whole tank, which, that's the, the uh, A tank, aseptic tank, or sometimes called a surge tank. And then we've got our aseptic filler. And of course, coming into our aseptic filler, we've got the packaged material from outside. And coming out of it, we've got the finished product. So that's, that's the system that we're, we're talking about. So the aseptic filler, I guess, is the, the guts of the matter. Um, this is where the filling occurs. It's where the sterilization occurs, um, the sealing and all those sorts of things. So everything happens in there. And I guess this is where the uh, majority of the cost of aseptic filling uh, comes in. I've just um, uh, reproduced there a, a photo of a ELO pack. I'm not um, promoting ELO pack in any way. It's just that it was uh, a convenient one to, to show you just to demonstrate the, the, the components there. Um, and I've, I've got down the, the components are some sort of mechanism for transporting the packaging material and the packages. Now, it's a little bit hard to see the packaging material in that in this one. It's on the left hand side of that slide, but you'll see the the little conveyor belt at the at the right hand side conveying the the um, uh, packaged product out of the system. Um, some sort of package sterilizing system that's on the left hand side of that, and it's a little bit hard to see uh, what that's um, what that entails. But I'll I'll show you a breakdown of that a bit later on. Um, and then the aseptic chamber, and that's where the product is filled into the package. So once you have your sterile package, it goes into that, um, that zone and is filled aseptically so that no other bacteria get in. And then it's uh, capped and sealed in some way so that the, uh, uh, so that it's all kept sterile. Now, I just want to talk about some of the methods of of sterilizing the container because if we don't sterilize our container properly then we've got bacteria there we've, we've got non-sterile products so um, that's what we're trying to avoid and remember we're trying to to have an aim of of uh, one in ten thousand uh, non-sterile packages at the end so that's a fairly fairly stiff um, requirement hydrogen peroxide's been the the mainstay in terms of sterilizing material, sterilizing uh, solution. Uh, it's, bacteria are sensitive to that and that's not related to their, their heat resistance. So just because you have a, a bacterium that will um, survive, say, pasteurization, doesn't mean to say it's going to survive hydrogen peroxide. <clears throat> and how, how well the, uh, the system works depends on the peroxide concentration and also the temperature that we use it at. And I'll put there the minimum conditions for aseptic packaging and, and you'll find in most of the uh, aseptic fillers that this is the sort of conditions that, the, that are used. 30% hydrogen peroxide at about 70 degrees for at least six seconds. Now you'll see in, in some, um, some plants where, um, particularly in ESL plants, they're, they're using hydrogen peroxide, but at much lower concentrations than that, and even lower temperatures and just for a very short time. And you have to realize that those conditions will reduce the number of bacteria, but they won't eliminate all the bacteria. So for a, a properly, properly sterile pack, you need to have um, these minimum conditions to, uh, uh, to, to sterilize them. Now the peroxide is usually removed with, with hot air and I'll show you a few examples here where hot air is used at, um, at various temperatures. I've got 170 to 200 there. Some, some are using a lower temperature than that. Um, but well, I'll show you later about that. Now, hydrogen peroxide can also be used with UV and there's a couple of advantages of doing that. Um, UV alone is not particularly effective for um, reducing bacteria, but when used in conjunction with hydrogen peroxide, it's, it's, uh, it's a very effective uh, combination. And the big advantage is that you can use a lot less hydrogen peroxide, a lot lower concentration, uh, something like one to 2% rather than 30%. Uh, 
And um, that means that you reduce the amount of peroxide used, but also reduces the problems of residual peroxide. Now, residual peroxide is one thing that's often tested for because um, a lot of um, regulations stipulate how much peroxide can be left in the, in the package. Uh, typically, no more than 0.5 parts per million um, of, um, uh, of hydrogen peroxide should be present in the, in the product. So if it's, um, if it's exported, for example, that sort of um, uh, requirement is, is, uh, has to be adhered to. Um, the next one is peracetic acid, or sometimes it's called peroxyacetic acid. Peroxyacetic acid is made by oxidizing uh, acetic acid. It's, uh, it's a very effective sterilant. Um, it's, um, it's particularly used for um, the surfaces in filling machines. And uh, because it's um, more volatile than hydrogen peroxide, you can't remove it with hot air. So it has to be removed with, with sterile water followed by um, uh, drying with, uh, with hot air. A related one is what's called oxonia, which is a, a mixture of peracetic acid and hydrogen peroxide, and sometimes we do the acetic acid um, as well, used at about 40 to 60 degrees. And that's, that's used in, um, uh, particularly in, in um, machines that are using plastic bottles, um, high density polyethylene or, or, or PET. Um, Ethylene oxide gas is one that's used for, particularly for uh, sterilizing equipment and, uh, and containers, but um, it's, um, it, it's not widely, widely used. The next one, ionizing radiation, and this is not um, something that um, a dairy factory is going to use in, in, their, in their, um, their premises, but a lot of the preformed packages are sterilized with um, uh, with ionizing radiation at around about 12 kilogram. Now I've, I've got a K there in, in red because I realized that I put 12, 12, 12 gray before. So you might like to just take a note that that's, uh, that's wrong there in your notes. Um, saturated steam is the other one. Now saturated steam is a very uh, reliable um, sterilant uh, provided um, uh, you can get high enough temperatures, um, and that's you can only get that under pressure, of course. And it's one that's used for for sterilising um, the the filling um, bung of um, uh, likes of the aseptic uh, bag bag um, bags like the one I've shown there. Some of you might be familiar with the intercept um, process that, um, uh, of of uh, uh, of sterilization or sorry of uh, aseptic filling um, and I've just taken this off the web and this is how the uh, the filling part of the uh, a, uh, intercept bag is um, is sterilized so the that little um, bung on the on the bag has two membranes one inner and one outer firstly the outer one is sterilized with steam uh, then the the outer membrane is, is broken to allow the, the product to, to come in. And the, the bottom membrane uh, is not fully attached to the, uh, to the inside of the bag. And so the, the product can go through that. Once it's filled, then the, you'll see down the bottom, uh, in number four, uh, it's sealed with the, uh, a heat seal that comes up underneath. And then it's reflushed with, with steam. So you'll see that steam is used to, to sterilize the outer membrane to start with, and then again to sterilize the inside of the, uh, the inner membrane after it's uh, been sealed up. So um, that's, that's one of the, uh, one of the uh, applications of, of steam sterilization. Now I just want to talk about some of the different consumer packages and you'll all recognize a lot of these. Um, the paperboard carton, I guess, is one of the most common ones, and, and that's where aseptic packaging really took off. Uh, so the top ones there, the, the, uh, the typical Tetra brick, and then you've got the, the square package like the, the Devondale ones. Um, the plastic bottles, and of course, there's a whole range that I could have put there. I've, that's the Brewster Brothers that you'll be familiar with. It's um, packaged by Coca-Cola here in Brisbane. Um, 
Then there's aseptic pouches. That's probably not as well known in this country, but um, in some other countries, uh, aseptic pouches are now the dominant uh, form of, of package for, for UHT products. And then, of course, the little cups, and a lot of you will be familiar with those if you've traveled in a plane or stayed in a motel or whatever. Um, and that's a little dairy farmer's one, which are, are quite common. Now, I've thrown this, this one in too. I think I've just changed the order of the, the, the slides, so it might be the next one in, in your, um, your notes. But um, So the aseptic bag in box, the intercept one, these are, this is an example of bulk packaging, and, and these, these are made in, in volumes up to 1,400 litres, so that's quite different from the consumer packs that I've just showed you. And just for interest's sake, I've, um, I've included down the bottom that you can actually get an aseptic ship um, this one uh, is showing uh, Professor Nelson from Purdue University admiring a, a, um, a replica version of one of these ships. That's a, a 2.4 metre long replica version. Um, and the ships, uh, they have something like 16 aseptic tanks, each one holding 2 million litres. It's, it's a little bit hard to get your mind around that. It's, uh, they've been used for orange juice. Um, but to my knowledge, uh, these are not being used for milk. So I really threw it in there just for, for uh, interest sake. I just find it quite fascinating that you can have a, a ship which can carry that much um, aseptic product. I hate to think what happens if you get one bug in, in the holding tank containing, containing 2 million litres of product. So the types of consumer packaging that I want to talk about, they, they're divided up into two different um, forms. One is where a preformed package is, is taken to the machine and the machine sterilizes that and, and fills it. And the other is where the machine or a machine on, on site um, uh, makes one of the, the cartons from, or, or, um, or bottles uh, from some material that's, that's brought in. So that's called the form fill seal seal system where you form the package, you fill it and then you seal it. So each one that I'll talk about, um, each of those four consumer packs that I, I mentioned um, can be um, obtained in both those forms. So if we take paperboard cartons, you've got the, the two different types. Um, the the preformed one, and some of you will know that know the combi block system, that's that uses a preformed one. So it's pre-creased so that it enables it to be easily formed on, on a machine uh, in, in lay flat blank cartons. So they're all flat, uh, but they've been pre-creased and ready to be folded up. Uh, then there's the ones that are made on site from pre-creased um, continuous roll. And these continuous rolls have a plastic strip sealed along one side. And I'll, I'll, I'll um, mention later why, why that's there. So this is a Tetra Bic type um, um, package. The paperboard is coated with polyethylene to, you know, uh, cardboard's obviously fairly permeable, so you need to be able to seal that. Um, and um, they always incorporate some sort of light and oxygen barrier. And the, um, <clears throat> the, the UHD cartons usually include a, a very thin aluminium foil and only about six microns thick. And that's very effective for eliminating light induced oxidation. And light induced oxidation is, is a real hassle, and as I'll talk about with the plastic bottles later on, um, a lot of steps have to be taken to, to avoid that. Now, both of these forms of um, paperboard uh, cartons come in uh, in pre printed form, uh, they're not printed after they're, uh, they're filled. So, this is a typical structure of the, the laminate used for the uh, for the, the paperboard cartons. So you have a, a polythene layer, you've got your paper layer, which is very, very pervious, uh, permeable. Um, you've got a polythene layer, then you've got aluminium foil, which is a very thin layer, and then polythene on the outside. So the outside of the package is going to be polythene, the inside of the package is going to be polythene. Now, if we take the system where the um, the package is made from a continuous roll of um, of, product, of, um, of paper or paperboard. This is the sort of system that um, uh, is used. So the <clears throat> uh, 
this is the laminated um, uh, material coming off the roll. You'll see here, this is our, our plastic strip along, along the edge. The product comes down here. This along the side is the longitudinal heat sealer. So you need to seal all the side. And the little, little diagram there underneath shows you how that um, plastic seal um, um, finishes up. So the plastic seal actually overlap, overlaps the plastic seal on the other side and, and it's heat sealed. And by doing that, you eliminate um, the product accessing the inside of uh, the paperboard and so forth, where there could be bacteria and, and you couldn't get leakage and so forth. So it's a very, very um, sleek way, I suppose, of, of avoiding contamination from the, from the, the, the raw edge of the, uh, the paperboard. Now, of course, you get down to the bottom and you have a, uh, a heat seal, which um, uh, comes and heats and, and seals the the, the product off and of course you've got something that will chop off uh, the bottom carton and, and you, you finished up with a carton. After that the <clears throat> uh, it's packaged, it's it's formed into a, uh, a square package and um, and the, the little flaps are then uh, folded in and sealed. <clears throat> so with the um, the sealing uh, the pressure has to be such for that, on those seals to squeeze out all the all the products. You can imagine that you've got uh, that that little tube of uh, material there is filled with your milk or whatever what, whatever your product is, and the pressure has to be um, sufficient to to expel that. <clears throat> so the heat um, heat heat is used in those jaws, and the and that's usually done uh, by by induction um, and um, the thing about this particular product is that very little, there's very little headspace in there. Um, we've measured this at eight mils. When I say we, that's the royal we because my students did it, but eight mils per litre carton. And that compares with about 30 mils for a preformed carton. So that's quite important because that, that um, headspace is what contains air and it will, that's, it's the headspace which will cause the oxidation of, of our product over, over time. So that's one of the big differences between the preformed and the, and the, the, the form fill seal uh, carton. Now this is just a bit on the peroxide sterilization of the, uh, the paperboard. So as it comes off the, the reel, it goes through uh, a bath of, of hydrogen peroxide. Uh, you have squeezer rollers, which take out the majority of the, uh, of the, um, uh, the, the excess hydrogen peroxide, and then it goes through um, the, the sterile air uh, in in the in the tube, evaporates the rest of the uh, the hydrogen peroxide. <clears throat> this one on the right shows you a little bit different one, where the hydrogen peroxide goes through a bath, is squeezed, and then you've got your uh, your air um, at, at say 125 degrees. Uh, evaporating that um, hydrogen peroxide. Now this is um, a little diagram of what happens when we've got preformed cartons. It doesn't show as much detail as some of the others I've got, but you've got these erected cartons here. So these are ones that have come off one half of the, the machine that the, 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 uh, the flat packs have been um, folded up. Uh, the bottom has been um, uh, uh, completed and so it's an open open at the top. Uh, it's then sterilized um, uh, with um, UC peroxide and uh, and air and then the product is filled and then it's it's sealed um, after that so it's, um, it's it's quite a different system from what the from the one that's uh, formed from a, a real. Okay I'll talk a little bit about plastic bottles. Uh, the blow molded plastic bottles, um, usually made from uh, polyethylene or polypropylene or, or, um, or PET. Uh, as I mentioned before, light perme permeability is an issue with plastic bottles. And so um, some, some plastics are now incorporate uh, laminates and, and, and the laminate will include a, 
a layer which is um, uh, prevents light um, penetration. Uh, some use opaque sleeves and that one I showed you of the Brewster Brothers, that's a completely op opaque um, sleeve on there. That's a, a clear bottle, but it's um, it's been completely covered in a sleeve and that's, that's a not un uncommon uh, approach. Now, I talked about headspace for the um, the cartons, so the seven mils for the for the ones that are made on site, or or maybe thirty mils for the, the combi block ones. The head space volume in a plastic bottle is more like sixty mils for for a one liter bottle. So that's a, a real issue if you want to um, uh, reduce or eliminate um, oxidize or stale flavors, and particularly reduction of vitamins. So I know some companies have tried to add things like vitamin C in, in plastic bottles, but found it was of no use because the, uh, the, the large headspace uh, just um, degraded the, the vitamin C in a fairly short time. So, so there are issues that um, need to be considered there. And it's possible to, to put in a nitrogen headspace and so forth, but that's um, obviously more, more complex and, and more costly. So the three types of um, blow molded plastic bottles, um, the ones that are preformed, um, and they have to be sterilized and, and filled in an aseptic filler. The ones that are aseptically made on site by heating and blowing parasols, and that's what, that's what the little tubes of plastic are called. So they're, they're tube shaped plastic preforms they're called and, and, and they're blown um, on, on site. Um, with using very hot air. Uh, the temperature reaches something like 165 to 135 inside the bottle. So because of that, there's no need to, to sterilize it. That's enough, enough heat to, to, uh, to wipe out any bacteria that are in there. So that's, that's one issue with those, um, those particular bottles. The other ones are the aseptic, the ones that are, uh, are made on site by heating and blowing parasols that have a thread on them. And, I've showed you one there. That's one that I've, I've, I've got in my study here. Um, I just sat it on a plastic, on a, on a, um, uh, a glass jar. Um, it's about 85 millimetres long. And you'll see the, the thread on that and it's hollow. And so you can imagine it, it just going onto the machine and blowing it out to form a, um, a one litre bottle. So they're sterilised um, before being filled and sealed. The, the thread because the thread is, um, is quite, the part of the, um, uh, the bottle with the thread is quite thick, that doesn't get hot enough to, to sterilize, um, to, to kill the bacteria. So, so that, that bottle has to be um, sterilized on, on, um, on the machine. So this is one of the ones that, um, where you've got um, a plastic bottle that's, that's coming in from, from outside, it's, it's open, you have to spray on the outside and the inside. Then you've got to get rid of the peroxide spray uh, with hot air, sterile water rinse, um, and then uh, volumetric filling and cap sterilization. So the same sorts of things. The, the next one is where you have a bottle that's um, formed with, and it's still got the, it's still, it's closed. So inside is considered to be sterile because of the, the heat of the, uh, the blowing process, but the outside is not sterile and it's got to go into an aseptic zone. So that has to be sterilized. And then the, the cap has to be cut off um, and then filled. And you'll see here, you've got this filter here, which is filtering air coming in uh, so that all this is um, uh, under positive pressure, but it's, um, it's sterile air. The, the last type I'll talk, no, second last type, Plastic pouches, and I mentioned these are now becoming uh, fairly popular. And I guess the reason why they're popular is they're quite simple. They're, they're cheap, they're low cost, 20% of a cardboard container, and they're light. They're about the half, about half, as, um, half the weight of a plastic bottle. So you can see the advantages there immediately. And they maintain their ecologically better. Um, so the comparison is with a paperboard carton the energy requirement is about a quarter, um, air pollution about 20, 19% and water pollution about 1.9%. So compared with um, 
a paperboard carton, they come out well on top uh, in terms of um, ecology. And as I mentioned before, they're increasing in popularity and, and in some places they're now the major form of packaging. Uh, some of you might have seen them overseas, but I, I don't know of any any um, package, package systems in, um, in, in, in Australia. So they come in different forms of so the typical pillow pouch, which um, uh, we're used to, and they use they might have a spout or, or closure for or, or filling fitments. Um, and then you've got some stand up packs. These are ones that sort of open up at the bottom and and uh, and will stand up. Some even have a handle, and I I see Ecolean put out one uh, which has a, an air filled spine so that you can you can hold that. So various variations on a theme there. The plastic film that's used is um, usually a multi-layered one. And again, we've got the issue with uh, light barriers and, um, and oxygen barriers. So some use um, EVOH as a, um, uh, an oxygen barrier. And I'll put what EVOH is there. It's an ethylene vinyl um, alcohol. Uh, that should be EVOH equals that. Uh, some have um, calcium carbonate or chalk incorporated into them. So they're, they're, they're white. Um, and that, that helps to make them opaque, but it also stiffens them up as well. So this is a, a little diagram of how the, the pouch is um, sterilised and filled. And, and a lot of the same elements as what we've been talking about before with a hydrogen peroxide bath. Here they use 34% at 44 degrees. That's, um, that's a bit lower than what um, the minimum um, recommended conditions are. So <clears throat> um, that seems a bit low to me. Uh, and then you've got preheated air coming in and through a filter at 45 degrees to remove the excess peroxide. Uh, then it comes down here. It's a, it's a flat um, film coming through. It's sealed on, on both sides so that um, in, in the way that we showed you for the, the cartons, and then you've got a filling nozzle and um, you've got the sealing and cutting, finishing up with this little pillow, pillow pouch. Now, I, I took this one off the web and I, I think it incorporates a lot of the, the elements that we've been talking about. Um, it's um, labelled here patented technology, so you'll see that some, some details are missing from this machine, but um, I think it shows you the, the overall elements where we start from, from our film on the right hand side there goes through some sort of a sterilizing system here with, which is the um, the orange little area it then goes up through um, a sterilizing area and you can't see very much of what's in there but that's some sort of sterilizing area that'll be presumably hot air um, i said say hot sterilized air then then it goes into the filling zone and this is where the detail is lacking and it gets filled with product coming in here from the yellow zone, um, it gets filled and you've got um, an ultrasonic um, sealing device here uh, and that's not uncommon in some of these machines and then you've got your your, um, uh, your pillow pack coming off there. So, And these, these are just two services here, you've got both your sterilised air and, and your steam coming in. So that sort of shows you all the elements without um, a lot of the detail. Now the last one is the, is the cups, and again we can have the preformed cups or we can have the form filled seal cups. Uh, if we've got the preformed cups there, just put on a conveyor belt and, and pass through a peroxide bath, um, wash with sterile water and dry with hot air. So I think this is now becoming fairly familiar to you. We, this, is, this is fairly common through, throughout the, um, uh, the different systems. So after filling in the aseptic zone, they're sealed. They have an aluminium foil uh, lid put on them, and that's got a, a thin coating of a thermo, thermoplastic material which will, which will melt and seal um, when it's heated. The form fill seal cups, um, they're made on the, on the machine, so they come in a, in a roll in the form of a web. And a web is just uh, where you've got um, enough material for one, one cup, but it's connected with other ones just by a very thin uh, thin cord, so it's a bit like a, a spider web, if you like. Um, sterilised with 35% peroxide and passed through uh, a sterile tunnel at 130, 
having picked the subsidy, the peroxide plus the, um, the hot air. Um, the sterilized film is, is uh, fed into a thermoformer, which makes the, makes the cups and the filling and sealing is much the same as for the, the preformed cups. Just another couple of slides. This, this one is um, what we do with our product after we've got um, uh, it packaged. It's, we've got our aseptic packages. What we want to do is to make sure that the, the package uh, can't leak and um, we can't get any bacteria getting into the package afterwards during storage. So this is obviously an important area of the, the whole process and there's various ways it can be done. Obviously we'll, we'll, uh, we'll visually inspect the product um, as it, as it comes off and if there's certainly if there's any leaker, we, leakers we make sure that they're discarded. Uh, we can do destructive tests on a, on a proportion of the, the product and that's, um, that's routinely done by many companies and there are online non-destructive tests but a lot of these have been devised but um, to my knowledge I'm not too many have been commercialized so it's probably a case of watch this space for, for those. Now the destructive tests um, and I'll just mention the ones that are carried out on the paperboard cartons because they're, they're probably the most common ones um, in, in this country anyhow. Uh, there's, um, I mentioned about the, the seals that we have on the, uh, the, uh, the package. We've got the, uh, the, the seals along the side of the package the, and then we've got the seals at the top and the bottom, the, the transverse seals. Now, what you want to make sure is that both of those are going to be um, leak proof and the transverse seals are usually tested by in tear down tests to make sure the seal is is stronger than the packaging packaging material so if you do a tear down test and you try and pull it apart the seal shouldn't pull apart but the package material will um, and and the same with the um, uh, the seal along the, along the sides <clears throat> now any incomplete seals um, should be picked up in some sort of um, other test and a, a couple that I've mentioned here is a dye or conductivity test and just taking for example a conductivity test if you fill um, if you yeah if you fill a carton with water and you you place it in a brine bath you you just see whether in, whether or not any any brine gets into the into the water or not so it's a way of um, making sure that um, no ions can get through. If no ions can get through, then no bacteria can get through. Um, the, the dye test is done in a similar way. You put the uh, put a, a package of water into a into dye, and if anything, uh, any dye gets into the into the, the carton, then there's a, a leak somewhere. So that's a very quick rundown on integrity testing, which is much more involved than what um, what I've given you there. The last thing I just want to talk about is. Um, is validation of an aseptic packaging system and if you're going to set up an aseptic packaging system you want to make sure that when you start using it on what I call real product that um, you're going to have to achieve a, a certain non sterility rate um, or <clears throat> it's going to be sterile to to the level that you want it to be. <clears throat> now I've taken um, this from uh, the Tetra Pak manual for for doing this, but um, obviously there are other manuals around and other other procedures. But the the Tetra Pak system is that you do three separate trials on the plant on three different days, and you you combine um, the the samples from each each of those. Um, so you might do it on something like skim milk, and the number of unsterile packages is a measure of the the sterility that you want to uh, you want to achieve, and I've taken here a, a target criterion of one in 1,000 um, non-sterile packages. Now, remember I said our, our ultimate aim is really one in 10,000. So just keep that in mind. And there's, um, it's been statistically worked out how many samples you will need to take and how many non-sterile packages of those samples you can, um, you can, you can stand to, um, to be able to validate your, your plant. So it's based on statistics, as I say, and at the 95% confidence limit. So, so this this little table here tells you um, what um, what's going to be passed and what's going to be a fail. So, 
if you take three separate trials, the minimum number of samples you can take is 3,000 samples. Now, to me, that sounds a lot, and probably to you, it sounds a lot. Um, but if you only take 3,000 samples, you, you cannot have any non-sterile packs detected in, in those. <clears throat> if you take a lot more uh, samples, say you take 9,000, the last, co last row there, um, you can have up to four non-sterile packs in there and still achieve a defect rate of one in 1,000. Now, I mentioned to, to you a couple of times that our, our uh, target is one in 10,000. So if we want one in 10,000, um, we've got to mul multiply all those sampling numbers by, uh, by 10. And as I said right at the end of there, the, the joys of being a microbiologist, um, having to do, um, say, 30,000 samples to, uh, and achieve no, um, no sterile packs is a, is a pretty, pretty big ask. But um, I think that just typifies the, this whole technology, that it's a very exacting um, technology. We can't afford to have um, very many aseptic packs at all. So that's um, a sampling plan um, based on, um, on the Tetra Pak book. Now, um, it's a Tetra Pak book, which is a guideline for microbiology, microbiological evaluation of commercially sterile product. I think in your notes, I might've left out the sterile product. So I just realized that earlier on. So just a few notes to conclude. Um, uh, aseptic packaging is an essential part of UHT processing. If we didn't have it, we wouldn't be able to, um, to have uh, packages which last at room temperature for six, nine or even 12 months. To achieve the sterility, we need to, um, to maintain it all the way through from the, the sterilization holding tube to the product in the final sealed package. We've got several different um, packaging formats and I guess different people are going to choose different ones uh, and we can have them either preformed or we can form them on site. Uh, sterilization of packaging material or the containers, um, mostly done with hydrogen peroxide, but we do have some other options available. We need to test the integrity of the package to make sure we're not putting out uh, liquors and so forth. And to set up a plant in the first place, we need um, some strict uh, verification protocols to ensure that we've um, got everything right. Okay, with that, um, I've given you a few, um, a bit of bedtime reading there. Uh, some of those, are, uh, you'll see whole books on um, aseptic packaging. Um, and um, the, the book that um, Jenny mentioned before that Mike Lewis and myself wrote 2017, that's, that contains a section on aseptic packaging, which I've taken um, some from for, for this presentation. I've also taken some from uh, Gordon Robertson's paper uh, particularly the, the last one in that list. Um, it's a nice little uh, summary, I, I guess, of aseptic packaging in the Encyclopedia of Dairy Sciences. So with that, thank you very much for your attention. And um, if you've got any questions, I'll um, attempt to answer them. Okay, thanks so much, Hilton. Okay, everybody, please type in your questions. We'll give you a couple of minutes to get those going. Right. Um, Hilton, just while, um, oh, here we go. We've got Alice has got a um, question there for you. Okay, just wonder if there was work on this, if you question equipment. Just, um, if you read it out, please. Okay, yeah. thank you, Hilton. Just wondering if there is work in the aseptic packaging equipment and manufacturing industry to find systems able to work with more environmentally friendly packaging materials than the traditional plastics, etc. Uh, that's a very good question, Alice, and I'm, I'm afraid I'm not up with it enough to, to know what the latest are in, in, um, in those areas, but um, I'm, I'm sure the packaging, packaging people have been working on that. They've certainly been working on reducing the, the volume of material they put in packages, so the packages have got lighter over time, um, but of course there's a limit to that because they have to be robust enough for transport and so forth. So. Um, yes, I'm, I'm sure they have, but I don't know what the latest is. Just in addition to that answer, Hilton, um, Alice, we did have Gordon Robertson um, 
yeah, booked to do a webinar last year, but unfortunately he was unwell. So I might check with him. And yeah, that'd be good. Otherwise, we are looking at doing something in the next semester. So good. we'll find mm. somebody. Yeah, um, just while other people are thinking of questions, um, Bannister Downs in Western Australia, in the south down in the far southwest, they use those plastic um, bag containers. Oh, yes. Yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah. The, um, the pouches. Yes. Yeah, okay, good. Mm. Very popular. Mm, thanks, yeah. Okay, right. more questions. Anything coming through there? Here we okay. go. From Janice, if the one in 10,000 failure rate is for validation of sterility before going live, what is the sampling plan expected for routine testing for sterility after going live? Is the rate of one in 1,000 for failures or still? Oh, look, that's, that's a very good, very good question. Um, it's certainly not, uh, nowhere near one in, one in um, a thousand. Um, and I should have checked it up before I, before I came on, but um, different companies have different rates, but they're certainly not not one in not one in a thousand. So um, certainly certainly not the three thousand that I mentioned before. Um, look, I'm sorry I haven't got that that at, uh, at hand. I, I know. If, can, um, if we want to catch up, I've got people's emails. If you yeah. Want okay. To see yeah. Something out later. Yeah, it's it's in our book. I'm sure. I, I remember seeing. Yeah. Mm. Okay. So highly recommend you um, try and get hold of Hilton and um, Mike's book, and that might help you there with a few more answers. So with that, um, there don't seem to be any more questions coming through, so we'll close today's webinar.